I think it's uh, it's really clear looking at uh, uh, all of the information that we have that uh, that this case went the way it did because the uh, these uh, um, deputy sheriffs changed their testimony. Now we made that statement uh, after the trial, and uh, I made a decision after the trial not to attempt to. Uh, to re-prosecute it, even though it was uh, it was a hung jury, it was 11 to 1 for not guilty. It was very clear at that point that um, there would not there wouldn't be any change in terms of the uh, our ability to prosecute the case. That everything uh, uh, had changed from the time of the grand jury to the time of the of the trial testimony, and so um, it wouldn't it wouldn't make sense to try to prosecute ag again. So uh, I uh, told. Uh, our deputies to uh, to go ahead and dismiss the case at that point. I don't think that you can look at one element of the case and say that that made or break, broke the case. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you can do. I think you got to look at the totality of, you know, how the case was presented, uh, how people were prepared for the case, um, you know, case preparation. But I, I think you have to look at the entire thing. Uh, my focus, though, my focus is going to be on the conduct. Of my personnel, the explanation that we gave that it was because of uh, the um, police officers or the or the uh, deputy sheriffs not not testifying truthfully, I believe, is uh, the correct explanation uh, as to uh, as to what happened. I think there was a uh, phrase uh, that was used uh, called "code of silence," and let me explain that uh, all of the. Um, statements that we've made uh, concerning this particular case are meant to apply uh, just to this particular case and not to uh, suggest that there's uh, any kind of an agency-wide policy that involving something called a code of silence. Uh, as a matter of fact, this case was brought to us by the Sheriff's Department and uh, you know, they investigated the case and they brought us the case and, and uh, we looked at it and went ahead and investigated further and uh, and develop the cases you could see at the at the grand jury hearing. So, um, as far as uh, some kind of agency-wide policy or or any sort of an official doctrine involving uh, code of silence, uh, uh, that uh, that is that is not the case. And I just wanted to make that clear that what we're talking about here, uh, the changes in testimony and the things that happen in this case, um, are are limited to. Uh, to this particular case, and we don't mean to try to expand that to uh, to other um, areas. Um, I think that, um, and, and the district attorney has made it clear that it was never his intent for that to, for that statement to apply to law enforcement in general. Uh, that the intent was specifically uh, to this case, and the conduct in this case. But that did create quite a firestorm, I would say, certainly in the county. Um, because uh, when you use terms like code of silence, um, that to me denotes that there is a pervasive, uh, you know, s system in the department where people are not going to cooperate or that the, the management of the department condones that type of behavior and as couldn't absolutely be farther from the truth. And you accept his um, explanation that was only referring to that I case? do. I do. I accept the district attorney's explanation. Uh, this would have been a simple case for the sheriff or the sheriff's department to cover up if they wanted to just not just not bring it to the DA's office because uh, the uh, defendant uh, or excuse me not the defendant but the the victim here Lars uh, didn't even complain I mean he he was realistic enough to know that uh, uh, that his complaint by itself uh, wouldn't uh, create a case that could be prosecuted you know, because of who he is. And so, I mean, we would need to have corroboration besides strictly his statement to, uh, to, to, to bring a case. And so the Sheriff's Department brought, brought the case. Let me say, let me say that, we, that we work with, uh, uh, with uh, deputy sheriffs and police officers and, uh, and uh, quite a number of different law enforcement agencies day in and day out. And, uh, and we um, uh, develop uh, cases through their testimony, and uh, in our in our experience, and I can tell you my personal experience uh, with uh, with with law enforcement officers, many many law enforcement officers is that is that they offer truthful testimony, and they don't shift and change their testimony around. And I've even had I've had the experience on more than one occasion where rather than make a case better, 
or, or rather than risk losing a case, uh, they would just tell the truth. And so, I mean, you know, I hope I can make that impression that, 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 that what we generally get from the police in, in the big majority of cases is solid, truthful testimony. Uh, would I, I think basically your question is, would I rather not see um, deputy sheriffs or, or police officers who lie as witnesses off the force? Or, or maybe I turned that a little bit too much. Would I rather see them off the force if they're going to lie when they testify? Absolutely. Absolutely, because it, uh, I mean, not only is it, is it bad for the integrity of that particular case and, and uh, hurt, hurt that particular case, but um, it, it's, um, you know, it's just a bad, it's just a bad thing all the way around. It, it, when people learn of it, they, they start questioning whether or not any police officers tell the truth, but they do. Yeah, I, I'm not, you know, I don't believe in painting, you know, if you have misconduct, by individuals, I can tell you, we will root it out and we will take the appropriate measures, and I have uh, in, this, in other cases as well. So uh, we'll, we deal with individuals. Uh, we don't blanket an entire department because of the conduct of a few.